Before we start the keynote, let me introduce um, Matthew. Matthew Dennis is a philosopher of technology, specializing in the ethics of artificial intelligence and persuasive technologies. He's a research fellow in ethics of socially disruptive technologies at the Technical University of Eindhoven. And he has visiting positions at the University of Oxford's, Oxford's Faculty of Philosophy and at the University of Amsterdam's Institute for Advanced Studies. And before that, he was a research fellow at the TU Delft and an early career innovation fellow at the University of Warwick. His research focuses on how we can live well with emerging and future technologies, as well as how digital well-being is affected by gender, income, intercultural factors. And he published a paper on um, digital well-being in the post-pandemic uh, world, and that was that paper that caught my attention. And because it has a good fit with the Kaiser Conference, I thought it would be very interesting to have him as the first keynote speaker of our conference. And so thank you, uh, Mathieu, for being here and for giving this presentation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Monique. Um, I'd also like to do, give a few thank yous before I start. So first, I'd like to thank Monique, I'd like to thank Frederick, and I'd like to thank Zanva and Get for giving me this opportunity to address you all this morning. Um, it is my pleasure to start this conference, particularly as I'm very much aware that it's the first um, in-person event that you have had for two years. And uh, that really relates to the topic of what I'm going to talk about today, which will be digital well-being and how we can think about digital well-being in this post-COVID age. I have titled the talk, Post-Pandemic Worlds, and as Frederick uh, pointed out this morning, it's not clear what uh, sort of post-pandemic world we have entered into now. Uh, the world has always had pandemics. It's clear that it's, this is not going to be the last one. <clears throat> and yet, I feel that some of the things that have happened over the last 36 months have really changed uh, the way in which we think about connection, the way we think about our virtual lives, the way we think about our virtual lives and our in-person lives as being uh, combined in some way for a hybrid sort of meetings. Uh, this meeting, for example, will be recorded. And I don't think the, uh, the sessions were recorded before COVID happened. So this uh, idea that things should be recorded, disseminated, has got all sorts of reasons for taking place partly environmental ones, which I will mention in a moment. Okay, so uh, today, thinking about what I have to do over the next um, few minutes, uh, it really started me thinking about how it's a particular type of philosophical task to identify how the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus um, has changed how we think about online connection how it has changed how we live and how we organize our lives and ultimately how it changes our values. Now, the costs of the pandemic are yet to be calculated and yet its consequences seem to be indisputably manifold, intergenerational and affect different groups in different ways. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stakeholders within this situation and how they've been affected differently, particularly with relation to the digital sorts of technologies that we find ourselves uh, working on every day. So uh, my journey here really began by looking at digital well-being while at TU Delft, starting out a uh, Marie Curie there after my PhD and starting to work on this idea of digital well-being and starting to work a little bit on self-care apps and some of the things uh, that I learned during that time, I'm going to come back to uh, later in the talk, because I think self-care apps give us, uh, indicate a direction through which we might be able to think about living online in a more positive way, um, a way that's a different sort of strategy than some of the existing strategies that have been uh, proposed to deal with this post-COVID age where we're going to spend at least a significant proportion of our time online whether that's to prevent um, getting infected with a virus, whether it's COVID-19 or another uh, sort of um, 
virus that comes along later, um, and the way in which that really has uh, a change on how we live uh, collectively. Okay, so I'm going to start by talking about some of the predictions uh, that were given right at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic for how this situation might affect us. I think some of these predictions were wildly inaccurate and it's going to require that we all think back uh, for the first to 36 months ago to sort of February, um, April 2020 when this all began and we were all contemplating how this was going to affect our personal lives, how this was going to affect our social lives, how it's going to affect our politics. And I think some of those predictions uh, have been better and worse and have stood the test of time uh, to a greater or lesser extent. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about digital well-being uh, and how we might be able to deal with some of the challenges that the COVID-19 pandemic has thrown upon us. Okay, so what were these predictions? So this was my favorite one uh, that was published in the New York Times in April 2020. They interviewed Scott Kelly, a veteran astronaut, and they asked him to talk a little bit about his reflections on what's happened, what he expects to happen from his experience of being in space. So, uh, Mr. Kelly talked about how seeing the Earth from space gives us this feeling that we're all connected. And this was well documented from the uh, moon landings in 1969 onwards. This idea that we are inescapably connected. And Scott Kelly, um, God bless him, uh, said that he thought that COVID was likely to engender this same kind of realization that we're collectively together, we have this common enemy to fight. This wasn't just um, a, a view uh, held by, by Mr. Kelly, however. Uh, some of the uh, most famous academics uh, had similar sorts of uh, views on this. Um, and in the book that we will be having uh, coming out on COVID uh, in the summer, there will be um, a, a sort of overview of the various different predictions and how some of those uh, didn't, really didn't come to pass. So again, um, coronavirus is about confronting our common fate, about highlighting our connections, showing that national borders are just uh, uh, human constructs and that we are inevitably connected in some profound way. Okay, so that was the rather optimistic, I think, uh, interpretations of what might, the predictions of what might happen. Um, what happened uh, was something much more like uh, Susan Vojcicki, uh, the CEO of YouTube, who predicted very early on that coronavirus would uh, cause an acceleration of our digital lives. And it's for this reason that I want to talk about digital well-being today and why I think this topic has an increased urgency. So it's something that at least I was working on before the pandemic happened, and now there have been so many different factors that have entered into this problem, it has become more complex and a lot more interesting. Okay, so I'll, after talking about some of these predictions, I'm going to say what digital well-being is. And I think all of us in this room will have some sort of an intuitive grasp of what it is to be, uh, to be addicted, to be compulsively using our mobile devices, or to be uh, clicking, uh, swiping, scrolling on our laptops. Um, this is a very well-known idea. Um, I'm going to give a, a more of a philosophical, technical definition of what digital well-being is so that we understand how it's different to the ethics of technology, how it occupies a particular space within the ethics of t technology, one that deserves a particular kind of attention. Without this kind of attention, I think it get lo gets lost in these broader ethical questions, which of course are really important. Then I'm going to say something about what threatens digital well-being, uh, particularly with respect to information and persuasion, how technologies have been designed to undermine digital well-being, and I'll say something about the business model behind that process. Next, I'll talk about the three strategies that have been offered to promote digital well-being, and I'm going to argue that there should be a fourth strategy that we should consider. I've called that repurposing persuasive technologies for digital well-being. Um, but if we have time for a Q&A, which I hope we do, uh, then I would be like to get some questions on what you think that uh, the problems with that strategy are. I'm going to talk about some of the ethical worries, what that strategy looks like from an ethical point of view, how persuasive technologies have the capacity to undermine 
um, our autonomy and our sense of responsibility, amongst other things. Now, no talk on digital well-being would be complete without saying something about the future of digital well-being, some of the things that we might be asked to think about uh, when we're looking ahead. Now, I've mentioned some of the environmental issues, which are really important. Uh, obviously, uh, many of us uh, travelled uh, to come here, um, but it was notable that there were, when we looked at the slideshow about the attendees of this conference, there was a, a local dimension to it. Many people came from either the Benelux region or from Germany, or from Europe at least. I think there has had a change in cultural precedence. As I mentioned earlier, we're often uh, required to record uh, events which happen which we would otherwise have to travel to. And I think this says something about how our attitudes towards issues relating to sustainability have changed over the pandemic and actually how digital well-being plays an important part of that. Okay, then I'm going to say something about intercultural uh, questions which relate to digital well-being because, of course, it would be wrong to have a purely Western conception of this topic when digital well-being is a global problem, one that affects us all. So I'll say something about that and some recent work I've begun on that to do with East Asian philosophy, particularly Confucianism. And finally, no talk would be complete without saying something about the metaverse and how that might present certain challenges for digital well-being. And I'm going to say, um, open that up for a discussion because I'm notoriously bad at predicting the future of uh, online technologies. When mobile phones came out, I wasn't, uh, I didn't think anyone would really want one um, and they didn't think they'd catch on. I was a big fan of MySpace before Facebook came out, so I'd be interested to hear about your thoughts on whether the metaverse will, be, will become a thing. And if so, I think the, the implications for digital well-being will be obvious, but also very grave. Okay, so what is digital well-being? I mean, this term is often used, uh, it has a lots of different synonyms. People often talk about digital wellness. If you are a parent, you may be thinking about how your children are using their smartphones. I have a young goddaughter now. She's about 10, um, just approaching 11, and she's already talking about getting her first smartphone. And there's been a discussion within the family about when this is going to be. It's probably going to be about 12. I think that's the sort of agreement, much to Julia's consternation, because she wants to get this thing a lot earlier, as her classmates have one, and they're all starting to communicate. So what is digital well-being? When philosophers talk about this, they talk about digital well-being as the impact of digital technologies upon well-being. And we may be, you may be asking yourself, well, what is well-being? Well, well-being is some kind of notion of prudential value. So what it is for us to lead a good life, a life that's good for us. Now, as philosophers such as Roger Crisp sometimes note, much attention has been paid to the idea of moral normativity, uh, less so to the idea of prudential normativity. So in short, the difference between these two terms, moral normativity affects our ethical lives in so far as they affect our use of, let's say, digital technology on other people. So we might think about something like cyberbullying, a good example of how a digital technology gives rise to a moral problem, how one person is using this technology to affect another, Whereas prudential normativity, it's about how these technologies, these digital technologies, are affecting ourselves. So the effect of being online uh, all of the time, being continuously connected, being able to pick up a smart device and being able to look up a piece of information, um, to ask Google at any point in your day, uh, what effects do these have on human flourishing? These are the sorts of questions that philosophers that are interested in digital well-being should ask. I should also say that there's a lot of really interesting work on moral normativity, and I've put an example of uh, one book that's came out relatively recently, uh, Evil Online, by Dean Cocking and Jeroen van den Hoven, which really gives a, a good understanding and a good account of what these moral normative questions are with relation to digital technologies. If we want to look at prudential value, we're going to have to find a different sort of literature. And that's what I want to talk about today, to introduce you to some of these things. Okay, so what threatens digital well-being? And I think this topic is, a, is an easy one to talk about uh, with, a, with a group of people who are either specialists or non-specialists. 
And this is partly because we each have an understanding of what digital well-being is from a first personal point of view. We each have a conception of how much we feel we like to be looking at our smartphones when it's appropriate to take it out at dinner time um, or at a, at a family uh, gathering. Uh, all of these questions are um, very live to us. And we're also aware about what threatens digital well-being. The answer is quite simple. Persuasive technologies that keep us clicking, scrolling, and swiping. So examples of persuasive technologies, I'm thinking today of e-nudges, the notification function, micro-targeting, and gamification. And I'm going to talk a little bit about gamification and self-care apps later in the talk. Now, one thing that I will say about persuasive technologies, it's not been an area um, that's been looked at so far for digital well-being, and that's what I think is missing in today's debate. The strategies are missing an opportunity to think about how we can actively use technology to cultivate digital well-being, rather than thinking of other strategies that somehow uh, mop up the work that technology is doing us, that somehow thwart the actions of persuasive technologies. Okay, and who uses these technologies? Well, big tech, uh, very simple. Uh, these technologies are routinely deployed by big tech companies to keep us clicking, scrolling, and swiping. Uh, why do they do this, you may ask? Well, I think the best person uh, to address this question would be Shazana Zuboff, um, a digital sociologist, I think, but also with some philosophical tendencies, uh, who tells a very nice story in surveillance capitalism of the the development of how technologies, uh, technology companies thought of their business model. They began by thinking of their business model in terms of print media, old-fashioned newspapers, where consumers were going to be given a nice article to read, something about the world that they want to find out about, what's going on in the news, and then on the side of the article, there'd be an advert for something. So the idea being, the business model of print media, is that the more you read and you provide good content for people, uh, then they are able to, uh, you're able to sell ads to third parties and people can just passively consume the ads and then they want to go out and buy a Rolex or buy a Mercedes, something like that. Now, this was the first wave which uh, online technology companies followed and it was closely followed by a second wave which I think was much more dangerous for digital well-being. The idea being that tech companies just wanted to increase user engagement at whatever cost. It didn't matter um, what uh, the contents that consumers were consuming. All they wanted to do was to give consumers something that would keep them compulsively clicking, scrolling, and swiping in order for them to gather and harvest to scrape the consumer's data. And that data could be then sold to third parties in a way which was much more valuable than just selling an advert uh, for what the third party was trying to sell. So I think that story is quite well known now, so I won't linger on it. But I want to give an overview now of the different sorts of strategies that can answer uh, the sorts of problems that Shazana Zuboff articulates. What are the strategies? Well, the first type of strategy was looking at the virtues and the capabilities of users, of the users of technology, of people that use smartphones, that people have access to the internet. I'll say something about that in a moment. The second strategy was looking at the capabilities of designers. So what capabilities do designers need to design for digital well-being in mind? What kind of virtues and vices should we be worried about here? The third is the regulation of tech companies. I'll say something about the experience of that in China in a few moments. Uh, and the fourth one, which is what I'm going to argue for today, is the idea that we can repurpose persuasive technologies for digital well-being. And my view is that we have to pursue all four of these strategies in a post-COVID world where we will be expected to be online for a lot more of the time. Okay, so user-based strategies. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, these strategies are those promoted by big tech companies, uh, but also, perhaps more surprisingly, even the largest NGO for digital well-being that some of you may have heard of, the Center for Humane Technology, US-based think tank. So, some of you may have seen 
the social dilemma recently, which had a lot of attention. It was put um, onto, onto uh, went to Netflix, and it went onto YouTube for free. Uh, the Center for Humane Technology, which was the real promoter of this documentary, also uh, created versions of it that can be uh, shown in schools uh, for the right amount of time for a school class. It had a really wide uh, appeal, and I think it really changed the conversation around digital well-being in a way that uh, hopefully we will be, um, be able to enjoy the fruits of in years to come. Now, one thing that really struck me when watching uh, the documentary was that one of the uh, ex-tech uh, people, uh, and they were all uh, ex-tech, ex-Googlers, ex-Facebook people that were interviewed. They were all in their sort of uh, early 30s. They have uh, been uh, interviewed in these huge palatial uh, houses uh, because they clearly have made a lot of money in the tech industry before their conscience got the better of them and they decided that actually this was uh, something that they had to uh, come out of. So they all said the same thing, that they really regretted their input into um, working for big tech because the persuasive technologies that they developed they thought were extremely damaging. Now, without exception, they all said that they would not let their kids near uh, social media technology particularly until they were um, around uh, 16 to 18. They also made this point that in no other industry are the customers of the technology referred to as users, this idea of users. And why is this? There's only one other industry that does this, uh, as one of the interviewees pointed out, and that is the illegal drugs industry. And that is because the sorts of persuasive technologies that are used and routinely deployed are so persuasive and so compulsive, they're highly addictive. So users is the most appropriate term to call those people that use them every day. So I've written something on this, uh, which is to, to give an overview of the paper. Um, I call it the McDonald's model. So the idea that persuasive technologies could be deployed in these online technologies was promoted by tech companies in a very similar way to how the fast food industry tried to avoid legislation against their products in the 1990s. So the idea being, and you will have heard this expression probably, that fast food can be consumed as long as it is part of a healthy diet. Okay? And tech companies have adopted precisely the same strategy here. Uh, their products can be consumed, we can use Facebook, we can be on Instagram, it's okay to snap with your friends at whatever age, as long as you're doing other stuff. But of course, there's a disingenuousness to this argument because when these technologies are so, uh, so persuasive and so addictive, then we're not really given a choice. So I have argued that this is the wrong way to approach a technology uh, which is so addictive because it gives too much of an emphasis of responsibility on the users of this technology who don't really have a choice. Okay, the second approach is to do designers. So thinking about the virtues and vices that designers might have. And of course, many people in this room have had a significant practical experience of working in the engineering domains with these technologies or technologies like them. Now, the problem with working with designers and thinking about the virtues and vices of designers, I think, is that we underestimate the strong corporate incentives that keep people towing the company line. So, of course, some of you will recognize Francis Haugen, um, a whistle, recent whistleblower from Meta, who came out and explained that actually uh, Instagram has got lots of information on how its product affects the body image of young women and girls in a way that's very damaging to these individuals. This information was never made public and it was actively denied. So when we're thinking about the virtues and vices of designers, we either have to pick, put our faith in people like Francis Haugen to blow the whistle, despite the strong corporate incentives not to, either financial or the fact that she had to sign numerous uh, NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. And if we're to do that, we're in a very a difficult situation. Okay, yeah, and I have written something on this uh, recently, which I could talk about later maybe. Okay, so regulation. Might this be a job for policymakers? Should we give the task 
of monitoring and trying to improve digital well-being to those who are responsible for creating policies, the EU, for example. Now, one reason for being wary of this, I think, is to look at the experience in East Asia, particularly in China, where they have tried to regulate online gaming in 2019 and 2021. Now, people who do e-sports in China, and they have a growing uh, number of people who are doing this over there, uh, have been outraged at the moment because the government in 2021 have limited the uh, use of gaming technologies, particularly uh, to one hour um, a day on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So this is a very uh, a radical curtailing of the amount of time that you can spend online. Now, just to be clear, this was not just done for the reasons of, of digital well-being, but it gives us an idea of what regulating for digital well-being might look like. We can imagine a world in which we only have access to social media apps for a length of time which has been prescribed by governmental policymakers. Now, as the Chinese experience has shown us, I think, there have been lots of reasons why uh, people don't like this. Uh, not just those who are under 18 and are practicing for esports. They typically practice uh, to be a professional esports player. You typically practice six hours plus a day. Uh, so re reducing that to three hours a week is obviously going to mean that the other uh, competitive teams, which are mainly based in South Korea, are going to enjoy a significant advantage. So we can start to see some of the problems with regulation. And of course, people can find ways around governmental regulation. They can break the law. They can find ways to hack the system. OK, so we're now at the fourth uh, possible, uh, possible strategy for dealing with digital well-being. And I think this is the most promising. It's the, it's the biggest weapon we have in this fight, I believe. And yet, it is one that courts the most um, ethical dangers. And this is the idea of repurposing these persuasive technologies for digital well-being, of thinking how we can rechange, we can change their ability to keep us sucked in, to keep us creating content which then can be sold to third parties, and we can think about how they can gently nudge us and direct us towards a better digital life. So why do we worry about this? Maybe we need all four strategies and there's no problem with the idea of repurposing. Well, firstly, I think we need to worry about some key human values that repurposing seems to threaten or undermine. Now, maybe the most obvious on this list is the autonomy uh, and responsibility um, value. So if we're thinking about our, the importance for human beings to be responsible or autonomous, if we're being persuaded to do something by technologies that just design, are designed in that way, it might undermine our capacity to exercise our autonomy, to uh, have responsibility for our actions in a hard, fast way. Another problem that we might have it with this would be to think about how repurposing might um, undermine key human faculties. Faculties such as focus, self-determination, being able to deliberate and to have free choice over our behavior. When we live in these online environments, which we are constantly streamed and directed, nudged towards better digital well-being, some of our key human faculties could be undermined. So those, those are some of the worries with this project of repurposing. But now I want to give you a bit of a better idea of what repurposing might look like from some of my research on self-care apps. OK, so need a little show of hands of anyone that's heard of this app, uh, an app called Forest. OK, so there's quite a few. I'd say that's about just under a quarter. So Forest was a real revelation for me when I started uh, working on this topic and started visiting uh, self-care app designers in the US mainly, although Forest is based in Taiwan. Forest is a self-care app which is explicitly designed for digital well-being and that uses gamification to nudge us towards a better online life. So how does it work? And it's quite, I think it's quite a nice little story. Um, so what happens is when you, you download the app onto your phone and then when you stop using uh, social media or whatever designated apps are out there, whatever apps you say, I don't want to do this, this is very bad for my digital well-being, to keep tweeting uh, during a conference or to be keeping checking my Instagram feed. 
uh, what happens is uh, the app will let you grow a small virtual tree. So very slowly, the time that you've relinquished your use of Facebook, uh, Instagram, other sorts of uh, social media technologies, the app will have a little tree that slowly starts to grow on your phone. So you're just watching this uh, little tree grow. Now, uh, if your tree gets very big, it starts to become populated with birds, um, and flowers grow on it, all sorts of things. But the problem is, as soon as you then send that sneaky tweet, uh, you decide to check your news feed, the tree dies. And people find they really don't like this uh, dimension of it when you have a, a virtual tree uh, that dies. Um, and this is because it's a highly effective game. So when you have uh, several different trees uh, in your forest, you've had a whole week of exercising good digital well-being, it's the, it's the gamification within this app that nudges you towards adopting a better set of digital precedents. There's also now a group function, so groups of people can uh, come together to say that they want to have better digital well-being and they're all going to agree to work on cultivating their forest by refraining uh, by for using these sorts of online technologies. And it's shown to be very effective. Okay, so this idea of repurposing in the case of forests involves, from an ethical point of view, taking the external persuasive forces that tech companies use to try and keep us clicking, scrolling, and swiping, and making them internal by asking the user to download the app and to sign up for a set of amount of time that they're going to uh, stay offline, to choose reflectively when they're in a reflective state that they're going to have this amount of time online and this amount offline, and then to use a persuasive technology to gently nudge them back into that position. So what about the ethics of repurposing? I think maybe I've said uh, enough about this about when I talked about the values and the quintessential human faculties that repurposing at least threatens. So I want to say there are two clues to how this, how, why this might be permissible. Now, Philosophers sometimes call these agential exceptions, which is really just a fancy word for some people who are exceptional because their capacity as agents has not been fully developed. So think about those who are very young or very old, who are inexperienced or have some other kind of infirmity. Now, in these cases, we often say that persuasion can be legitimately applied, such as children. Uh, we might say that we can persuade our kids uh, to do certain things in their best interests because they don't have the requisite capacities. They haven't been developed enough in order to do this. Now, if we think about what uh, some of those um, interviewees on The Social Dilemma said about users, we might think that maybe we're all in this boat. Maybe we're all uh, users in this way. Maybe we should make exceptions for ourselves in this, uh, from this point of view because uh, we're unable to refrain from clicking, scrolling, and swiping. We may also think about these self-care apps and think about how these self-care apps do offer a way in which it can be done. Now, I think there are some problems about it, and that really comes when we think about scaling up. So it's okay to download Forest, but I think it's always going to be a minoritarian kind of concern because it's very difficult to imagine how a search engine could work using those principles or how a social media network could be developed with the idea that everyone has got to care uh, for their digital well-being to a greater extent. It seems like the idea of a social network is best served when people are consuming as much content for as much of the time as possible, not from refraining for how about how long and how much they use online technologies. Okay, so technologies of self-persuasion, I think they offer us a possible way to do this. Okay, so to sum up, I think we need all of these four strategies. I think none is sufficient on its own. The virtues and capabilities of users are really important. Technology is always changing, and we can't constantly rely on repurposing persuasive technologies. We need to be able to adapt and move ourselves when we encounter, encounter a different type of technological innovation. So we need to think about the virtues and capabilities of users. That's really important. But it alone, it's insufficient. 
because implying that we have the capacity to moderate our own use of technology takes a very unrealistic view about how persuasive persuasive technologies are, and they're likely to get more persuasive, not less persuasive. Um, and it also takes an unrealistic capacity of our ability to moderate these things. Um, I think there's also something to be said about how different individuals within our society are susceptible to a different extent to being persuaded and to being addicted to these kinds of persuasive technologies. I think we often talk about this in terms of uh, addiction to drink or drugs. It just seems that in general populations, there'll be a small minority of people that just have a really hard time saying no to this stuff uh, for one reason or another. So it might be that the same approach captures some people in that population, but it doesn't capture everybody. So I think we need other strategies too. So character traits of designers, I think that's really important. I think we do need to be asking questions of the leaders of the world's largest tech companies, people like Mark Zuckerberg, to give direction on this and to have the right character traits, to have the right uh, virtues and vices, uh, to be able to design in a responsible way to make um, us, to give us a world which digital well-being is a value that's constantly cultivated. I also think we need to regulate tech companies. I think this is probably my least favorite um, strategy for cultivating digital well-being. But I think there comes a point where it is necessary to think about regulation, partly because um, the other strategies are insufficient alone. Finally, I think we need to think very seriously about repurposing persuasive technologies for digital well-being. I think there are lessons to be learned from self-care apps to think about how these apps uh, use uh, processes uh, which are extremely powerful. The techniques they use are very powerful. And we need to work out how the ethical questions that repurposing persuasive technologies involve can be answered. I think there are ways in which we can do that by thinking of a genteel exceptions and thinking about how reflection, reflection of how long we want to spend online, what role the online world has in our in-person lives. I think these are good ways to do it, but that is a part of the strategy that really needs to be taken very seriously. Okay, so coming to the end now, and then I'll break into some questions. Um, I wanted to say something about the future of digital well-being, and as promised, something about the metaverse. Okay, so there are three sort of obvious things to say here. Um, the first is environmental awareness, to think about how maybe the recent pandemic um, has shown us something about the role of our behaviors with relation to environmental concerns and sustainability. Maybe there are some reasons we didn't need to be flying everywhere and some tasks, routine meetings, for example, those of you who are in staff meetings, um, probably uh, like me, have quickly realized that these meetings, you know, they're, they're good in person, but they're also very effective online. You can just sit, you can pause, you can have it at your desk. Uh, but there are environmental concerns to do with travel. Maybe online technologies provide a real tool, if not a weapon, in this fight for sustainability that we are now go going into with all seriousness. Okay, so one nice twist, and those of you who have uh, used the Forest app will already know this. Uh, in a quite a nice twist of the, maybe it's done by the marketing people for the app, but every time you successfully grow a gamified tree with forest, a small virtual tree, uh, the company plants a tree. Um, and as their marketing teams uh, make, uh, give uh, every uh, reason to say, uh, they've actually planted over a million trees. And there is a connection, I think, with when we're scrolling, clicking, and swiping, what's the environmental impact of that? I'm still old enough to remember when email first came out, People made a big deal about how this was going to create a paperless society. We wouldn't have to print out stuff anymore. So everyone was firing emails, and then actually it seemed fine to send out a, a newsletter or a junk mail, including large links to videos uh, and other sorts of uh, media content. Now, I think particularly with the uh, sustainable AI debate, we're starting to realize that these have quite grave uh, sustainable, ecological, environmental consequences, uh, partly because every email that we send is hosted 
on a server uh, somewhere uh, which has to be constantly cooled down. So when we click on that YouTube link, uh, that is actually creating some kind of an environmental impact. These servers and the uh, cooling systems that involve take masses of power. Uh, yeah, so this is really built into the business model. There's a, a picture of a, one of these data centers um, on the slideshow. Uh, also, technology companies have built this in to their model, although companies like Google have claimed to be uh, environmentally uh, carbon neutral, very environmentally friendly, it's no accident that, uh, for example, if you think about YouTube Premium, if you want to just listen to the video, let's just say it's a lecture, maybe you're listening to something um, and you uh, don't want to actually watch it, you want to go for a jog, then you actually have to pay for the premium function. The problem with that is uh, people like to do this, uh, but of course it takes a lot less energy to listen to the video because then you're not having to stream. And yet tech companies don't uh, make this part of their business model insofar as uh, it costs an extra subscription service to be able to do this. So I think tech companies have got a lot of room here to think more imaginatively how digital well-being and environmental concerns are actually connected. <coughs> Two things that you might not have thought are connected at all, they're actually intimately connected. So not only does forest uh, help by planting a tree when you've grown a virtual tree, but actually it reduces the amount of power that these data centers are using when you haven't been working on that Word document, you've just been scrolling and uh, clicking, swiping, you've just been in that YouTube uh, tunnel and just going from video to video looking at the recommender system, uh, what the recommender system uh, promotes to you. Okay, so yeah, I mentioned this at the beginning, but I think there are some intercultural dimensions to this problem. These are a couple of papers under review to do with Confucianism and East Asian philosophy, looking at how we need a global approach to digital well-being. There is, of course, uh, when we're talking about human flourishing, um, there is a, a grave uh, cultural uh, dependency on the Western tradition within our societies. And I think when we're thinking imaginatively and openly about what digital well-being involves, how it connects to human flourishing, we need an intercultural approach to what human flourishing looks like. Um, I think this is really important, not least because it gets people on board uh, from uh, from many different cultures. And of course, within the West, we're the, uh, by far and away the smallest minority of people that use the internet. And I think that needs to be remembered. Okay, yeah, last, last slide, just on the metaverse, really. I mean, if you think it's bad now, it's only gonna get worse, that's my prediction. Um, you can imagine how strong and uh, persuasive these kinds of online environments can be when you put them in, um, in an in a immersive system where you're using VR uh, to uh, integrate yourself within these online environments. So I think that's, yeah, the problems are only going to get more profound particularly if we think about the amount of data and the, the strength of the nudges that tech companies can use in these immersive environments. It's very difficult to switch off. One thing which is maybe kind of gives a sort of uh, an indication of how this might go is lots of the work on well-being and digital technologies, it's been very inconclusive. So it was very inconclusive at the beginning until around 2010, 2011, so when the iPhone came out, the first uh, commercially available, uh, the most uh, widespread commercially available smartphone, uh, people started, sociologists and uh, psychologists of digital well-being, really started to notice there was a statistically significant difference. Uh, whereas before we still had many different social media technologies, but there wasn't really a difference on people's well-being. Why was that? Well, the consensus is now that when we have a smartphone that's mobile, it allows us to watch and to use digital technologies in all aspects of our lives. We're no longer harnessed to a computer, a mainframe, or a laptop. We can be lying in bed, I'm sure we've all done it, uh, scrolling along and just clicking, uh, clicking all the way through. Um, so it makes the availability of technologies a lot more um, rampant. I think that will really happen again with the metaverse when we're uh, in a VR environment if we do go down this route. Again, remember what I said about not being able to predict technology at all. Um, but if we do go down this route, then the capacity and the threats for digital well-being seem to become a lot more grave. Okay, thank you.
Try it now. Yes. John Kirsty Anthony, I actually tried to, to post the question on the in the Volvo, but it seems they're not uh, looking at it, so I can take it uh, live. Uh, to what extent should we use persuasive technology for promoting climate friendly behavior? And how should we do that? Sorry, could you repeat it, the question, please? <laughs> Yes, I, I, I see that, but I think that's very hard for him to hear. To what extent should we use persuasive technology for promoting climate-friendly behavior? Yeah, sorry, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think some of the problems um, seem to be quite similar to how things are within the digital well-being debate. Uh, these uh, same capabilities that human beings have and some of their values seem to be threatened or undermined by nudging people in general. Um, I think both things, as I tried to make clear in the latter half of the presentation, this idea of digital well-being and environmental concerns are actually very closely connected. Um, I think the same ethical problems uh, attend to them, and yet I think the uh, importance of either digital well-being and certainly climate concerns are so grave that we need to use everything that we can to throw at it. So I think it is uh, legitimate to use uh, persuasive technologies such as nudging people towards better, more green behavior. I think the philosophical <coughs> arguments have been made there and I think it's clearly uh, okay to pursue that strategy in the face of such grave threats. And yet, a little bit like the uh, role of regulation in this story, I think that's in some ways, that's the, the biggest stick that you can uh, really uh, beat um, or create a sort of better digital world for people, but it comes at higher costs. So I would say to minimize uh, that kind of approach and yet uh, to use the sorts of smaller sticks, if you like, such as nudging, such as uh, repurposing uh, persuasive technologies, uh, to use those as a primary way in which to create these better outcomes for all of us. Uh, yeah, so I think they are connected, these environmental concerns and digital well-being. I think they're very closely connected in a way that's often not underestimated. Some people, although I think this is the minority, uh, can feel, oh, digital well-being, that's not for me. I don't have a problem with my smartphone. Um, I, I'm okay with how much I use the internet. I'm, I'm, I'm used to, you know, spending, uh, you know, many hours a day on YouTube just watching stuff. I think how that affects us uh, is really, uh, the jury is still out at the moment. I think it's, there's never been a time in human history where we've been so um, able to be connected to one another. And I think we'll only, we're only going to discover the effects of this um, in years to come. So I suppose I adopt a, a cautionary approach uh, to be careful with both these things. I think the, the evidence with the environmental concerns is very clear, but I think with digital well-being, it's the same, it's the same story. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. Uh, Matthew, great talk. Uh, very good choice of speaker and theme. Um, so two short questions. One is you, you talk about uh, persuasive technology and social networks, but they're not really the same, right? So maybe there is nothing in the network or in the network effects themselves that are harmful, right? But this model in which you pack and sell attention and data, and th if this is the case, so then we can repurpose networks to actually leverage on the network effects, right, to change in the incentive. So this is the first point. Second point is your focus was on individual agents, but can you comment on the well-being of collective agents and the impact to collective intentionality and the well-being of institutions? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Two excellent questions. I've got a lot to say uh, definitely about the second one and maybe something more to think about with the first one, the difference between network effects, which seem to be really at the heart of um, social media technologies, for example, that's just how they work, uh, and persuasive technologies, which seem more optional or permissive. They don't have to be deployed to such an extent, or they can be more thoughtfully deployed. And I think that's really part of the story uh, where we want to keep the uh, very real and very tangible benefits of network effects that uh, social media technologies offer, and then to think much more cautiously about the persuasive technologies that are deployed uh, within these systems. So, yeah, I mean, the network effects in themselves, I think, present really grave challenges. And just uh, in my answer to the, to the last uh, gentleman, um, 
yeah, they're, they're really grave um, challenges, partly because it's unprecedented that human beings have been so connected. We just don't know how that's going to work out. Uh, there are already, I think for the first, in, 2000, in the 2010s onwards, I think there was a kind of uh, a moment when it just seemed like it was going to be okay. We could kind of handle it. Um, but then uh, in the, in the um, well, just before COVID, I think, really, um, there were certain signs that things weren't maybe as good as they could be. And they were just to do with network effects, really, just people being connected uh, to such an extent. WhatsApp groups in various parts of the global south with hundreds of people on them could, that could deploy, that could deploy um, information uh, that wasn't true to uh, ha and have great uh, social, environmental, political, um, and ethical consequences. Um, and there are numerous examples of this. It just took a while for these, these technologies and these examples to kick in. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, network effects, there's just so much to say about that. Uh, also to do with online celebrity and the way in which an individual can just be taken up and become extremely famous to the benefit of that individual, or famous for the wrong things, to the deficit of that individual, uh, a digital record that can never be erased, um, that's permanent, and that also, also uh, not known to uh, millions of people uh, th across the world, not just in their immediate community. So I think network effects are hard enough to deal with uh, enough, and I haven't thought enough about those. I'd like to think more and maybe talk to you afterwards about this. Uh, persuasive technologies is the area that we can do something about at the moment. Now, thinking about back to the second question, to do with collective digital well-being, you know, I have focused on individual uh, well-being. Um, that's because I think well-being is something that its kind of its last term is with the individual. But of course, it's affected by how individuals uh, do in groups and the groups that they're part of. So recently, I've been working on this idea of ecological senses of digital well-being, the way that we function in digital environments, particularly social media environments, can only really be understood in terms of the ecology, the other individuals within that group. So and if, to do this, I looked at a little bit at trolling and that how a troll can completely destroy the digital well-being of everybody uh, in this room. Um, if we're all in the same online community and then suddenly one person acts in a way which is incompatible with everyone else's digital well-being by provoking, uh, by saying something contentious. And of course, the way things are set up right now with the content model, trolling is promoted, going viral is promoted. So how can we think outside of an individualistic approach one where we understand how individuals' digital well-being is really a consequence of how they function in groups and communities. Well, that's something that I started with the, uh, the work on Confucianism and the East Asian approaches, because Confucius, Confucius has a very more, a much more sort of socially integrated uh, set of conceptual resources where he thinks about the individual's identity in terms of the, the larger groups that they are part of and how being a f able to be a flourishing individual requires to be a good member of your family in the first instance, and then your community in the second instance, then your nation, up until the whole cosmos to be this sort of cosmic. Now, of course, those conceptual resources are rather whimsical and maybe don't have a lot to do with the very real problems, the technical problems that are facing us, but I think they do provide some inspiration for rethinking uh, digital well-being outside of this individualized model, which has been the source of so many of the problems that we're encountering today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your nice uh, presentation. And um, my, um, well, let's say, perspective that I want to bring forward is also related to, uh, as a follow-up of the question of Giancarlo, is, on, um, I get the impression that your your view is mainly on the I and the self perspective, and not so much on the us and the we. That we, in a way, we are. Why are we on uh, social media, or uh, we want to be in touch with our friends or our colleagues or uh, the world uh, uh, of our community uh, in in the village, in the city, or or whatsoever. And uh, so, and that's what I would call the, the, the monopoly of the contacts, of my contacts. So when I join a Facebook or a TikTok or, or what, they want to have my contacts, but then I am in a silo 
uh, only dealing with uh, Facebook uh, 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 subscribers or with TikTok subscribers. And that also makes that, uh, let's say, we cannot communicate with each other over the different social media. When you compare this to the, uh, let's say, the advent and the emergence of email, uh, email that was also proposed in the, say, uh, 70s, and, and now there are different email clients, but whether I use Gmail or Outlook or other email programs, uh, they also own my contacts, but they are open to others. Now, this digital well-being also relates to the silo where I'm in, and that I cannot, as a, for instance, I, I only use LinkedIn, for instance, uh, but I cannot communicate from my LinkedIn with Facebook or TikTok or whatsoever. Uh, and isn't that silo not a threat in this digital well-being? And also, given the fake news, uh, let's say, uh, uh, development that, that people start putting in, certain silos, certain fake news, that they cannot be, let's say, controlled from other silos. So what is your perspective on that? Well, yeah, well, thank you for such an excellent question. Um, I have thought a little bit about this, particularly the difference between email being an open system. You know, you don't have to have one particular provider to send another email to another provider, and how this really is different to the way social media has been set up, and not just social media, um, you know, other communication technologies like WhatsApp. If you have a WhatsApp account, you can't you know, connect to a Signal account, uh, for example. Um, and I think there probably are some problems, how that creates problems for a certain uh, sense of digital subjectivity. The way in which we engage with the world has to be mediated uh, with, through a certain sort of platform, which requires us to think in terms of LinkedIn, you know, I've got all of my jobs here, or to have a Twitter account where you have a short bio and then you have to write everything in 140 characters. And these ways uh, in which we're framed and our subjectivity has changed is quite different to the uh, more open um, idea with behind email where you can write within uh, certain parameters, but those parameters can be shared across silos. So I think that's, yeah, I have to think about that more. I think it's part of the business model for a start. I think it's a lot more money in creating a social media um, platform uh, which silos everybody uh, and then creating the hype for it so that everybody wants to use this particular um, platform, such as the clubhouse phenomenon that some of you may have heard of during the pandemic, this podcasting, uh, live podcasting system. It just became extremely trendy. The share price uh, rocketed. Uh, they made a lot of money. And then, um, you know, a year or so afterwards, I don't know, I won't ask for a show of hands of who's using Clubhouse because I don't think there'll many, be many people in the room. So I think this open and siloed, these open and siloed structures do have an effect on not just digital well-being, but the entire kind of digital culture that we're part of. Um, I think generally open systems are probably better. Uh, and yet... Um, some of the problems I've looked at today to do with digital well-being would apply to open systems as well as closed ones. Of course, the deployment of persuasive technologies is in some ways easier on closed systems because they can be much more specific about what they're asking you to do, the information they gather, the way they nudge you to behave on those platforms. Um, yeah, so, so that's, that's one thing. I mean... Thinking a bit about the technical idea that we are connected up, and maybe this is coming back to the, the previous um, questioner's question, uh, I've been thinking a bit about Elon Musk's proposed takeover of Twitter recently, and I'm sure everybody has a view on this uh, in this room. And I think there are some really grave ethical worries with it, and I you know, really share uh, lots of the uh, premonition and wariness with other members of my community about the dangers of somebody who's very wealthy and has a lot of influence and quite a lot of personality uh, having control over this particular platform. And yet I want to say something positive uh, with respect to this. And that, a little bit like Elon with that process of trying to take over and to buy Twitter, recognizes it as a quintessential, a very important uh, technology that we, as he puts it, we need to have a collective digital public square where we can discuss stuff. 
And if you combine that with some of his other projects, such as Starlink project, Give Everybody Internet, uh, he really is ramping up this idea that it's good to be connected all of the time, wherever you are. You can have a satellite dish, and you can be on Twitter and participate in this uh, global conversation. Now, how that works out, I'm quite nervous about, really, um, partly because I think there's partly to do with the unprecedented nature of being connected all the time uh, to other people across the other side of the planet. I think there are limitations to how good that is for us. Um, some of you will have heard of the Dunbar's number, the amount of people that we can be meaningfully connected to, and it's ridiculously low compared to the number of Twitter followers or the number of Facebook friends many of us will have. Um, so I think there are problems with this approach, uh, but I'm interested to see what Elon Musk's sort of perspective and the direction he takes uh, with that project if he takes it on board, uh, especially given that you know, he wants to put people on Mars and he sees uh, Twitter as an equally important venture in the furthering of humanity's uh, options and uh, potential. Um, so, so yeah, the jury's out on that, but I think it's a really important system. Thank you.